Okay, so I'm going to talk about you know the most common cause of uh, transient monocular uh, vision loss, and um, which is uh, retinal ischemia due to embolism. And I'm also just going to talk about vasculitis as well, uh, because obviously you know when we are evaluating someone on call or in clinic, you know it's really important to evaluate for these things. Um, so, you know, as far as embolism goes, if we, you know, miss a case of where we should have, you know, worked them up to, you know, minimize their stroke risk factors, you know, we could have prevented a stroke that they could have had. And then for vasculitis, you know, obviously letting someone go out of your clinic without treating them or evaluating them for a GCA at least um, could lead them to become blind. So these are the most uh, important things to keep in mind and uh, work up. So um, this NASET trial, which was done uh, in the, uh, was published in the early 1990s, uh, evaluated the role of carotid endarterectomy in symptomatic patients. And a significant number of patients that they enrolled in the study had transient monocular blindness. Um, and they found that uh, having this transient monocular blindness or amaurosis was associated with a significantly increased risk of stroke uh, in the next uh, three years. Uh, and 1.4% of their patients that had amaurosis um, had disabling or fatal strokes. So this is, you know, why it's really important for us to, you know, evaluate patients for their stroke risk factors and try to minimize them. Um, they found that for the uh, patients with uh, amaurosis, uh, carotid endarterectomy uh, may have benefit um, if they have um, three or more of the following risk factors in addition to having the amaurosis. So, uh, you know, the one that we always hear about is the severity of the stenosis. So between 80 and 94% was associated with the increased risk. If you have uh, less than that, it's, you know, it's not as strong of a risk factor. And then if you have uh, more than 94%, actually, it's less of a risk uh, for future stroke as well. And also age, sex, history of um, TIAs or stroke and claudication. So these are all things that, you know, if you were to evaluate someone uh, for amaurosis and uh, they were to be or um, seen by a vascular surgeon, uh, these are the things they would consider in deciding whether or not to do um, an endarterectomy. Uh, I thought, you know, one weakness of this study is I don't know if they all got um, eye examinations, um, which I feel like if someone, you know, before working someone up for a stroke, I think it could be important to rule out other causes. Um, and also another weakness was that uh, actually their result for doing endarterectomies on the high-risk patients wasn't statistically significant, although it was like so close. But I, I think that um, clinically it is significant, but maybe the vascular surgeons may feel differently. You're saying more than 94% stenosis decreases your risk of getting Compared to 80 to 94. Mm -hmm. Uh, I, I guess maybe the thought process is that's like so stable, it's just like no flow is getting through that it's not likely to shower off emboli. I don't know if you can add anything, Dr. Degree or Gurji. No, you know, it was, it, it used to be um, thought that 70% and above, and mm -hmm. then um, uh, was the most significant. But, mm -hmm. uh, you know, this study really is the classic study. This is the one and um, and then they followed these people for a long time too, yeah. which is a good strength of it that they did follow up and mm -hmm. find that you know so many of these people got had strokes. And I don't know what the percentages are for, um, like, uh, I think they also did hemispheric TIAs and then minor strokes. So the cutoffs might be different, but this was the, like just the results for the amaurosis patients. Um, so there have been uh, some subsequent studies that showed that um, these patients that present with amaurosis are at pretty high risk for concurrent stroke as well, now that we've moved towards evaluating these patients urgently uh, with MRI. So this study from MGH where they saw 400 patients in the ER with monocular vision loss, half of them they diagnosed with retinal ischemia, half of them um, did they diagnose with other causes of their vision loss, um, such as you know, ocular disease, tumors, migraine, syncope, and then you know of the patients with the uh, vision loss from ischemia, um, 13 of uh, 74 had acute strokes on MRI. 
And uh, this study below was uh, smaller, and this was actually um, uh, just patients with branch retinal or central retinal artery occlusions uh, where they did MRI soon afterward. And uh, basically, um, a quarter of them had um, acute strokes in the same uh, vascular territory. And uh, interestingly, you know, their patients also had some abnormalities either on neurological history or examination. Uh, and I didn't put the study up there, but you know, the risk of concurrent stroke for artery occlusions is the highest, you know, right after the event and then kind of drops off after that. You know, I guess maybe the thought process is that there's something going on systemically that's kind of if there's an unstable plaque that's showering emboli, that's most likely to happen acutely. So that's why it's really important to evaluate them urgently. Um, so, you know, systemic causes. Uh, so we talked about uh, emboli. Um, the sources of the emboli, you know, can include, you know, carotid stenosis, which is a, uh, probably the most common one, and then, you know, cardiac sources uh, such as hypokinesis, well, aneurysms, valvular disease, um, and uh, PFO, as well as uh, atrial uh, fibrillation. And there's also, you know, systemic stroke risk factors are, you know, also risk factors for the artery occlusions and uh, amaurosis as well. So uh, this photo on the right came from the BCSE. I think this is something that maybe is not very commonly clinically used, but we may need to know for our examinations. So uh, this just demonstrates like the three different types of plaques, uh, which um, Hey Ray, uh, the, I think he's the big proponent of it in Iowa. But in any case, cholesterol plaques are uh, yellow, um, as shown in A, and they're thought to be from the carotid. And then uh, platelet fibrin plaques are um, white, and they tend to be more distal, and they're thought to be cardiac in origin. And then the calcific uh, emboli um, are also white, and they're usually thought to be more proximal or close to the disc. Uh, and also from a cardiac origin, but more likely to be something like, you know, a calcific aortic stenosis or something like that. And then, um, so another important uh, topic uh, I wanted to cover is, you know, what kind of workup we should do when we see someone uh, with amaurosis. Obviously, everyone we see is going to get an eye exam. Um, but uh, just, you know, these are some more recently published um, papers telling, you know, what they do, you know, in Ulm, Germany and in Paris. So in Ulm, Germany, everyone um, gets sent, like, from this, you know, 100-kilometer area to this one ophthalmic emergency department where they get evaluated by, by an ophthalmologist, and then they get everyone with amaurosis gets, if they feel that it's likely due to retinal ischemia, gets admitted for MRI, carotid, echo, Holter, EKG, and blood tests. Uh, this was, a, I thought this was a good study because it kind of gave us an overview of, you know, if all these patients had eye exams, you know, what would they have? Uh, about a third of them had uh, normal fundus examinations, but two thirds of them, when you looked, did have BRAOs or uh, CRAOs, even though, you know, their symptoms were transient. Um, and then 23% uh, percent had concurrent strokes, uh, and 40% their systemic workup uh, was positive. Um, in Paris, uh, they have this SOS-TIA clinic where you can call in from anywhere in Paris and then, you know, a neurologist or a trained nurse answers the phone and talks you through it and if they feel that the, it's high suspicion enough, they'll send the patient over there uh, and then, you know, evaluate the patient themselves and then, you know, do a complete uh, workup as well. I thought that study was kind of interesting because um, they split up, they looked at all, all different types of transient vision loss. so. Um, over here, it's kind of small, but most of them had transient monocular blindness, obviously, but some of them had um, homonymous lateral hemianopia uh, that was transient, lone bilateral blindness, and um, what was the other one? Diplopia, or the other one was positive uh, visual phenomena. And, you know, obviously the patients with transient monocular blindness had increased, more, most increased risk um, of stroke uh, or or more likely to be diagnosed by the neurologist uh, with, yes? What is alone binocular blindness? They didn't, by lone bilateral Bilateral. blindness, yes. yeah. They didn't really explain. <laughs> Probably they just mean that uh, bilateral visual loss. Yeah. So. yeah. 
maybe in the absence of other symptoms, but I, they didn't explain it. This was all we got right there. Um, so uh, yeah, in this book, they didn't talk, they didn't, uh, maybe they did split it up by the risk of stroke, but this uh, table on the right is just like the likelihood of the uh, neurologist diagnosing them with a probable TIA, they, you know. And you know, just as far as things that we should consider when we're working patients up, I, I think you know sometimes we forget to check the blood pressure. You know, if they're not gonna go to the ER right away, we should probably be checking their blood pressure in clinic if we diagnose someone with a new you know CRAO or something like that. And then, you know, EKG. I think AFib is really important cause that you know we're always like looking for the physical source, but you know there can be um, you know paroxysmal AFib. Uh, so definitely EKG is indicated. I'm not, you know, as sure as how as far to go with the Holter monitor, an event monitor. I think maybe we could leave that up to people's primary care doctors or their neurologists. And then, you know, checking their blood work for hemoglobin A1C and lipids. And then, you know, as I listed here some, you know, other tests that we should consider based on our clinical suspicion. I think that, you know, for patients that are young, uh, we probably need to consider, you know, other etiologies of stroke, such as hypercoagulability, um, and then maybe, you know, a PFO uh, by checking for that when you get their echo by doing a bubble study. Uh, do you have any thoughts on that, Dr. Drury? Yeah, I, I would agree with that. Okay. And then, you know, also um, checking for things like, you know, if they have rheumatoid arthritis or syphilis or vasculitis, which we're going to talk about and you all know about. And I just wanted to put another plug out there for a box. So um, just so you know, I think we've all been over this many times, but if you don't know what to do with a patient that you diagnose with a retinal artery occlusion, it's on box. And basically, if it's happened within the last seven days, uh, they just go to the ER and let the neurologist, like Gurji, work them up however they think is appropriate. Just remind them that they do need to get an ESR and CRP because that's not necessarily part of their normal stroke workup. And um, But if it's been longer than seven days, uh, we do need to initiate the outpatient workup uh, as listed above and um, have them follow up in the stroke clinic as an outpatient. And the guidelines that the neurologist gave us for when they need to be seen in the stroke clinic are at the bottom there. And obviously uh, they need to fo follow up in retina, you know, and, and uh, start aspirin and anastatin. Yes. Oh, this is really good, this retinal artery condition, yeah. because now they can treat it. You know, if, they, if somebody does have a retinal artery condition, right. they're going to use TPA or something else. But um, oh, they are. Uh, antiphospholipid antibody mm -hmm. syndrome can mm -hmm. also present with transient macular blindness in mm -hmm. young adults. So mm -hmm. one thing I always do is check the fingernails for mm -hmm. signs of splinter hemorrhages, mm -hmm. and that can be a clue. Thank you. Well, this is supposed to be a protocol that neurology has agreed to, everybody's agreed right. to. Um, for, uh, I would say, you know, if it's somebody who's had a retinal artery occlusion um, and you're on call or whatever, I'd call Meryl and say, we've got a, we've got a stroke to the retina. Okay. And then, <laughs> then they'll burst into action. And don't, you, you may have, have to say stroke to the retina to get action. <laughs> okay, sounds good. But I think they will. Very quick. So some of these studies compared uh, patients with um, transient monocular blindness to hem hemispheric TIA. Actually, that NASET paper that I cited earlier found a lower risk um, for stroke in the patients that just had vision loss compared to the ones that had like you know weakness of their half of their body. Um, and this other paper uh, looked at and found that the patients that had where you Trans transient monocular blindness and you looked in and you saw a BRAO had a higher risk of stroke than uh, patients where you looked at and you didn't, you, it looked normal. And I think that possibly some of these are due to, you know, misclassification. It's hard to make that, it's a little scary to me to make that diagnosis just based on history. It, you know, I feel it's a lot more, it's a lot different when you actually look and you definitely see there's a BRAO, but still, even if they don't have one, I think they need to be worked up. So, um, 
temporal arteritis, uh, this is you know the other thing that we really need to make sure to roll out. 33% uh, of the patients that uh, presented with, uh, that had temporal arteritis, um, did have some transient visual loss. Um, and I did uh, read that um, it's kind of like a sign of like impending, like really bad permanent vision loss, but I didn't see any definite proof that that was the case. Um, so obviously ask everyone about their GCA review systems and get ESR, CRP, and platelets on everyone. Um, fluorescein angiography, you know, if you're kind of suspicious for um, GCA and you need some help making that diagnosis, can uh, pick up uh, kind of early um, disease by delayed uh, filling, which can be uh, choroidal, retinal, or uh, papillary. Uh, so I have some cases, they're not necessarily due to emboli, but it's just a couple of people I've seen on call with amaurosis recently. Uh, so this patient is a 33-year-old female uh, with transient monocular vision loss. She felt dizzy while she was working her computer, put her head down her arm to rest for several minutes, and then when she sat up, she was vision was totally black in her right eye. After about 10 minutes, it started to return just as a pinhole, then it got larger, and then it was totally back to normal after 20 minutes. She has a history of migraines with aura, um, which is usually blotchy vision in one eye for five to 10 minutes, followed by a terrible one-sided headache with light sensitivity. Um, she is taking oral contraceptives, um, and there's some relation between the oral contraceptives and her, he and her headaches. Um, the vision loss, yeah. she had any like, positive visual phenomena? No. Any changes? It, was just it was totally black, and she felt dizzy. And she didn't get a headache, which I forgot to tell you after. Uh, what would you guys do in for a workup? Eye exam, <laughs> good. <laughs> yes. So her eye exam, uh, she was 20/20, no APD. So the lamp exam was normal. What else would you do? Uh, I don't think ooh, that was done. But in her fun, I mean funness. Her funness was totally normal. Dilated exam, normal. I mean, so I'm really concerned that she's on a CP, but. You What do you think, Renee? What would you get? I mean, just based on the history, yeah. on the Mark Cole exam, the vasculopathic risk factor and embolize her high on differential. Even though she's 33? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Just the way that it presented. You were no family history class. Nope. Would you have her go to the ER to get a MRI with a DWI? And it was just one eye, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Is it the same eye she gets her aura? Uh, they alternate. I think she needs a workup with like hyperplasmability, mm -hmm. hyperviscosity, antiphospholipid antibodies, yeah. okay. um, EKG, okay. high blood pressure. Okay. Uh, blood pressure, very good, was normal. Um, uh, Dr. Taman also got a visual field, which was basically normal. Um, and then she got a MRI and MRA that day, uh, which was normal. Um, and then you know she discussed it you know with the neuro ophthalmology team and they decided not to get a hypercoagulability workup. Um, and then the patient uh, came back to clinic to see Dr. Katz and he felt that it was most likely um, vasospasm, uh, retinal vasospasm, which you'll talk about. Okay, uh, another case. Uh, this is a 40-year-old guy with vision loss in the left eye. He never had any headaches or like childhood car sickness or um, childhood abdominal pain or anyone in his, no one in his family has migraines. <laughs> but just a few weeks ago, he diagnosed himself with migraines because he's had some squiggles, uh, which were followed by headache. Um, and he looked, Googled it. He's like, okay, I have migraine, I'm fine. And then, but one day he got a really, really bad headache and his vision like, almost wholly went black in the left eye suddenly. Um, and uh, it got better within a day. And then he has no medical history or anything like that. He went to Instacare. Um, if you were the Instacare doctor, what would you do? Eye <laughs> exam. Eye exam. exam's normal. No, no ophthalmologist was consulted. That's a transfer. Tra call the transfer center? Okay. What? Um, what would you, initial test would you order before calling the transfer center? I mean, 
mean, these series of events happen at the age of 40. He's mm -hmm. never had this at all, like mm -hmm. when he was younger. Mm -hmm. Probably get a scan. What kind of scan would you get? I mean, at this point, just in an acute phase. Mm -hmm. if, MRI, if MRI is available, I would get one. But if, mm -hmm. you know, if you're worried about it, he said, like, you have a really bad headache, the worst mm -hmm. headache ever. Yeah. Scan for now yeah. okay. Right, I think that might be appropriate for initial workup just to make sure he doesn't have like bleed or you know, or something like that. But in any case, uh, he got a non contrast CT and then that was normal. So he got discharged from the Instacare. Um, and then he came back uh, with an even more severe headache and being NLP in that eye permanently. From a uh, carotid uh, dissection, with total thrombus of the left internal carotid. Did he have trauma or anything? Nope. I think no he had said. Other sign, like, yeah. No other sign, like other associated. No. So it was a spontaneous. Yeah. So. No more like chiropractic manipulation. No. I think he said something like he'd gone like, for, I don't know. There was something like months prior, which sounded unlikely to cause. I don't remember exactly what it was. You could get a dissection for fly fishing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. Oh, well. Give me your hair fix. I saw mm -hmm. lady yeah, that's, that's, that's well described as well. Yeah. <laughs> oh, no. So, it's it's scary, scary. It's a scary one. If you've got blood vessels in the sack, it's scary. Uh, okay. He did have some irregularities of his right internal carotid, which they felt like could have been FMD or fibromuscular dysplasia, but anyway. So wait, so what's the exact mechanism? You, you have, they had a dissection and through a clot? No, it's like the dissection clot closed off, I think, his, it, well, it, like, yeah. blocked off so the, all flow. Right? I think it was yeah. Wouldn't he have, like, a giant... He had distal, like... Okay, okay. It was like there was no flow, but okay. then there was distal circulation. Okay. Well, it's a more than one Okay. Yeah. So that's kind of scary. Anyway. Okay. There is another one here. Ninety-eight-year-old female. These are all from your call. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> Ninety-eight-year-old female with sudden vision loss. I got it. Got kind of exciting last night. So. This is just like last night. No. 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 <laughs> no. 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 <laughs> I, I keep I keep these like books of all the patients that I see on call, so I was looking back through them. Um, so uh, this was a 98-year-old female. She had sudden vision loss in that left eye. She has a history of AFib, aortic stenosis, breast cancer, hypothyroidism, AMD, and pseudophagia. And she said it got like so blurry she couldn't like see any letters through it. Um, but by the time I saw her, oh, actually by the time she presented in the ER, she said it gradually improved over a few hours, but it didn't get all the way back to normal. So that's why she came into the ER. So um, you know she takes digoxin, carvedilol, aspirin, synthroid. Um, so she showed up to the ER, and they. We're like, okay, this is like, she's got lots of risk factors. She's 98. Like, we're going to go down the amaurosis route right away. Neurology saw her, like, wrote her consult. She was, like, being, she had had her CT and CTA, and she's being wheeled back to the MRI. And I was like, wait, can I look at her eye before we MRI her? Um, so her, uh, and her intraocular pressure was 27. She had four plus RBCs um, and a vitreous hemorrhage as well. Um, and so I was like, I don't think we need the MRI. I think this is, you know, there's a clear ophthalmic cause, so I think that was a good, I know we feel like they should consult us less often, but maybe sometimes they need to consult us more often. Like, I really think anyone with severe vision loss in one eye needs an eye exam. Um, <laughs> but maybe that's not available in every ER. You know, like Park City ER, they're not gonna get an ophthalmologist. Like, do they even have a neurologist at Park City ER? I don't think so. So, anyway. <laughs> Um, interestingly, the patient has continued to have similar vision loss episodes, but she hasn't come in acutely for it. And then by the time Shakur sees her, like two days later, everything's normal. She also has really bad dry eyes, but she definitely did have vitreous hemorrhage when I saw her. Okay, so here's some quiz questions. And I just want yes. to yes. see that key, so uh, mm -hmm. always, it, you know, 98 will separate CRP. And, yeah. You know, just flush, yeah. even though that was yeah. it, it's yeah. just that okay. age group yeah. is such high risk. Yes. So this was due to a vitreous hemorrhage? Is that yeah. 
Yeah. And hyphae, microhyphema. Yeah. So Spontaneous. It, was, uh, it wasn't like leakage of the blood from the vitreous into the, uh, or from the posterior fundus. To the anterior Yeah, chamber. I think That's so. That's what it was, okay. Yeah, or maybe Ugg syndrome, but we don't know. Like, she didn't have any, like, you know, cause for the thing. But anyway, it keeps happening, too. Um, all right, so uh, quiz. Uh, platelet fibrin plaques are usually found in this location, distal or proximal? We're answering now. Yeah. No, you're answering okay. <laughs> five minutes. <laughs> okay, um, fluorescing angiography and temporal arteritis can demonstrate um, delayed choroidal filling, delayed retinal filling, or delayed optic disc filling, or all of the above. And then uh, you see a 70-year-old male with a history of atrial fibrillation who tells you he totally lost his vision in his right eye for 30 minutes yesterday. Um, a gray curtain descended, and then the grayness gradually dissipated. He feels well otherwise. His eye exam is totally normal. What should you do? A, order a carotid Doppler to be done within the next week. B, call interventional radiology to see if they want to do intraarterial TPA. Uh, C, check blood pressure and send the patient to the ER and request a neurology consult. D, call Laura Hansen and ask her what to do. <laughs> For sure, D. Okay. Oh, the answer. Do, you, do you need more time to look? Oh, yeah. So the answers um, for this one, uh, I'd say C and D are correct either one. If you chose either one, you're okay. <laughs> Um, and then platelet fibrin plaques are distal, classically, and um, you can have delayed filling of all those areas in temporal arteritis.